well, what better way to spend a lazy Thursday afternoon than cruising the Royal Society card catalogue with head librarian Keith Moore and the white gloves of destiny. You know the drill. I'm going to close my eyes and the gloves are going to decide where in the archive we visit today. My eyes are closed. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't memorised the catalogue yet, so I don't know where I'm going. I'm going to go for this drawer here. And then I'm just feeling I'm going to go for this card here. What do we got? So you've got a registerable copy and you've got this uh, Gullier who is attempting to explain the phenomenon of the horizontal moon appearing bigger than when it's elevated many degrees above the horizon. Supported by an experiment. I love the moon. I'm fascinated yep. by the size of the moon. Do you know when the moon is really big on the horizon? Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's actually an illusion and it's actually not bigger. And if you do this, if you go backwards and look through your legs like this at the moon, it will look small again. Really? It's true. You try it. Next time you see one of those moons that looks really big, you I'm, do that. I'm going to be fascinated to see if Desaguliers, that's the experiment he does. Because, uh, you know, that would be brilliant. It would be amazing. I suspect it's not going to be. Keith has a coal slip yep. here. These are the slips filled out by any visitor to the Royal Society when they want to retrieve something from the vaults below. I am no exception to the rule. Now, the rule of the game, for those who've seen it before, is you actually do a second card, just in case that one's a bit of a dud. My eyes are closed. I'm going to go for a different drawer. Let's go right over the other side here. Let's go for here, and let's go quite early in the drawer. Let's go for here. James Paget. James Paget's a surgeon. Surgeon concerning John Harley's proposed paper. Not a lot of information there, not much no. cause for excitement. I'm a bit less optimistic about this one. So once Keith has filled out this slip, we will go down to the archive and see what destiny has in store for us. I'm not optimistic, but you know. Ah, oh, the first one, yeah, the first one could be, be right. okay. If he's drawn a picture. Of himself looking through his legs, that would be brilliant. I'm not <laughs> You'll be, you'll be laughing on the other side of I, your I, face. I, I would be, yes, I would. <laughs> Let's go and do it. Letterbook copies, registerable copies, and we want volume 19. 19, it's that one. Okay. Got that. See, the call slip goes where Keith took it out, so that when it's returned later on by Keith or someone else, it helps them find the spot to put it back, so, you know. Always thinking. Always thinking. Very good. So that's our first one. Our second one is manuscript 769. So this is going to be boxed. 769. There we go. All right. Very good. Excellent. Over to you, Brady. Thank you. All right, Keith. Let's do the second one first because I'm not holding out a lot of hope for this letter. I'm more enthusiastic about the moon. I think this is going to be a great letter. Yeah? MS, MS, this manuscript number, is the collected letters of my predecessor, Walter White. Walter White was your predecessor? Walter White was my predecessor. This is going to go off in the comments. I don't know if yeah. Keith knows about Walter White. Or... Uh, I, I kind of do know about Walter White, because mm. every time I search online for material to do with Walter White, this great librarian, I come up with a, a load of other stuff, which is really dull, you know? Yeah, so, just to do with making drugs and stuff. Uh, yeah, 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 honestly, yeah. Well, you want books. All right, we're breaking archive here. Yeah. It's in here, in this little... Little folder. Little folder. Oh, we've got some nice, yeah, some pretty few, letters. Few letters in there. There's some nice letterheads here. Look, British Museum. Yeah, who's that one from? Richard Owen. Richard Owen. Yeah, I great. know that name. Yep, great anatomist, paleontologist. Yeah, but here's yep. our one, number 73, March 15. Yeah, 1878, from Harewood Place, Hanover Square. Okay. Dear Mr. White. Dear Mr. White, I shall be glad... If Dr. John Harley's proposal paper is read in read in something. This is like a one-liner. This is yeah, like texting is. someone, okay, cool. Exactly <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Someone's had to archive this, they've put a card in the catalogue, it's like, does this need to be catalogued? Does this need to be kept? We don't know, because we, we don't quite know what historians are, are going to be looking for. So if, if uh, someone was interested in this proposal paper, and presumably this is proposal as a fellow of the Royal Society, it might be interesting to know what date it went in and, and who was pushing for the election. So it may only be a one-liner, but it gives a little snippet of information. 
Oh, hang on. This says here on the back here that Paget's physician... Yeah, was surgeon extraordinary to Queen Victoria. Was the surgeon to Queen Victoria. Yeah. Big so, figure. So he's an important dude. So, and someone's added Sir in front of his name. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and of course you had Richard Owen to begin with. Yep. Uh, and sandwiching him here, who have we got? Uh, Lord Ross, the president of the Ross Society, who had the large telescope at the castle in Parsonstown. So these are big name figures. Keith's kind of cheating a little bit here by looking at adjacent letters, trying to find things that are interesting. But I'm trying to bail you out here. Ben. That's all right. <laughs> that was a dud. That was what we call a dud. Great. It was great. It was great. Let's move on to the, yeah, this let's, moon let's, stuff. Let's park that one to one side. Here is our moon paper. An attempt to explain the phenomenon of the horizontal moon appearing bigger than when elevated many degrees above the horizon, supported by an experiment. This apparent increase of the moon's diameter, which a telescope with a micrometer shows to be only apparent. This is true, you see, mm. if you actually do the measurement, it's not bigger. The same thing you can do is you can hold up like a coin, like a 20 pence coin to the moon up there and the moon down there. And you'll see they're covering the same amount of coin. It's just an illusion. It says here that it's apparent owing to the following early prejudice mm -hmm. which we have imbibed from children oh. so this is something we, we've kind of learned from childhood okay now he goes on a bit here and writes a bit about it anything here look interesting to you yep so he's, he's he's giving a description here when we look at the sky towards the zenith we imagine it to be much nearer to us than when we look at it towards the horizon so that it does not appear spherical according to the vertical section and there's a there's a figure in here i'm guessing isn't it? yes there is he yeah. what he's talking about there is shown here oh and we've got the experiment here as well so yeah he's, he's got the the figure demonstrating the phenomena and then there's his experiment afterwards so yeah. let's have a look at that i have contrived the following experiments to illustrate this and this is the phenomenon he's talking about so i took two candles of equal height and bigness a b c d and having placed AB at the distance of six or eight feet from the eye, I placed CD at double that distance. Then, causing any unprejudiced person to look at the candles, I asked which was biggest, and the spectators said they were both of a bigness, and that they appeared so because he allowed for the greater distance of CD, and this also appeared to him when he looked through a small hole. So he's looking through a, a, a okay. pinhole. Okay, yeah. So no one's tricked here. They, the person yeah. said, yeah, same size candles. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then what does he do next? Then desiring to shut his eyes for a time, I took away the candle CD and placed the candle EF closer by the candle AB. And those it was as short again as the others and as little again in diameter. The spectator, when he opened his eyes, thought he saw the same candles as before. Tricked him! Tricked him, yeah, ah. sneaky. Whence it is to be concluded that when an object is thought to be twice as far from the eye as it was before, we think it to be twice as big. There we go. He's got a little, an, another little drawing here, so he must refer to that in the text, I'm guessing. Yeah. So the difference of distance of the moon in perigee and apogee will account for the different bigness of the horizontal moon at different times. Adding also that the consideration of the faintness, which vapours sometimes throw on the appearance, so there can be atmospheric interference, he's saying as well. Okay. Ah, and it ends there. Isn't it interesting? This is, I mean, this is in the 1700s mm -hmm. that they're doing this. Just as a little postscript, while we were looking for this paper, we stumbled across another paper by the same chap that he wrote months later, because he sent this into the Royal Society, and I think some people weren't convinced. And in this second paper, he does another experiment, this time using ivory bowls at different distances from the eye to show the same illusion. So he's really going in hard here on this, uh, on this experiment and convincing people that he's got it figured out. For a moon enthusiast, as I am, this is a pretty good pull, by the way, with the white gloves. Yeah, it's, it's not bad. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a kind of reasonable set of experiments to, to explain something that we kind of see all the time, but probably don't think about. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, from that point of view, pretty good. All right. Happy. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with that. We wouldn't be able to make objectivity videos without the support of our patrons. You see some of their names on the screen at the moment. A huge thanks to them. Go to patreon.com slash objectivity if you'd like to join them. In addition to helping us make these films, you'll also get access to some behind-the-scenes stuff, pictures, videos, lots of bonus material. 
The lightsaber obviously goes in that slot there. No good spacefarer would dare go to somewhere like the moon without their lightsaber. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. So they obviously left the lunar rovers behind. So this isn't from an actual lunar rover. What's this one from? 